Township in Liberty Park Elementary, or as affectionately we like to call ourselves, the pride of the East Side. <laughs> I am Dr. Tim Hansen, proud superintendent of Warren Township, and we are excited to be a part of Governor Holcomb's agenda announcement today. I would like to recognize Principal Jason Brooks, who's the principal here at Liberty Park. Thank you for hosting us today. I also want to thank our, our board president, Ms. Williams, and our board for their support today. I'm excited, and, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, who will lead our festivities this morning. Good afternoon, and thank you to Lincoln or Liberty Lincoln Park Elementary, Liberty Park, Liberty Park Elementary School, and thank you, Dr. Hansen, for hosting us. And it's great to be here. And as you all know, as Lieutenant Governor, I Sir, one of my duties is uh, constitutionally I'm president of the Senate, so next Monday we'll be going into session. And when we go into session every year, we ask ourselves, what is it that we can do that will make life better for Hoosier families and businesses? And we know that the next chapter in Indiana's history will be about quality of life. And why is that important? It's how we attract talent and how we grow our population. It used to be that people followed businesses, but today businesses are following people. And people are choosing to live where they enjoy that quality of life. And the governor is going to be touching upon those agenda items that really elevate the quality of life in Indiana. And I'd like to just touch briefly upon four that I either chair as an initiatives or through my agencies. First is the Next Level Invest initiative, where we look at attracting men and women who are transitioning out of the military to Indiana, match them up with employers, and then integrate them into our community. And to date, that initiative has had an $18 million impact on our economy. <coughs> The Indiana Destination Development Corporation, chaired by Elaine Needle, uh, it was created by the General Assembly to be able to attract talent, to be able to welcome visitors, and to be able to keep young people here in Indiana. And we are very humble Hoosiers, right? We work hard, we put our nose to the grindstone, and we don't pat ourselves on the back for doing that. But as a result, we don't always do a good job about telling the story of Indiana, and we have a great story to tell. And so the funding in this budget to be able to allow Indiana to compete with other states is extremely important when we look at growing our population and attracting talent. With inflation, with a war going on, with gas prices and food prices going up, it's important that Hoosiers that suffer from food insecurity, and that's one out of seven Hoosiers, have the resources and have the food to be able to enjoy their quality of life. And so that funding for food banks that is in the budget is extremely important. And then broadband, you know, being able to connect people is really that first step towards increasing our quality of life. And so taking the 70 million that we still have and being able to add that to the 268 million that has already been expended and awarded, connecting almost 75,000 Hoosiers will continue to elevate our quality of life, particularly in rural Indiana. And then the last initiative that I am very, very excited and proud of is the funding for mental health and the focus put on mental health. As you all know, the human cost of this pandemic is huge and it's going to continue to grow for years to come. And it affects our budgets, it affects our workforce, it affects our families. One out of five Hoosiers struggles with mental illness or addiction. And we all know Hoosiers that have faced those challenges. Sometimes our own family members. And my family's no exception. My mother suffered from depression. My sister Nancy died by suicide. And we buried my brother Larry this November. He was an alcoholic. That emphasis and that support for mental health is extremely critical for the quality of life that we all want to enjoy. And so those are just a few of the things 
that are in this incredible budget that has been put forth by the governor, and in my opinion, the greatest governor in the United States. Please help me welcome Governor Eric Holcomb. <laughs> we got a lot to go over, and you all have been sitting there like you've been in time out. Uh, it is a very comprehensive budget, and I first want to, before I get into the details, thank the superintendent and the principal and all of you. Much of the cabinet is here present with us. Um, thank you, Suzanne, as, as always. Good afternoon to everyone that's joining us, whether you're at work or at home, streaming, uh, live, playing through with us. Um, everything this administration does, and you'll see on the slides as we go through it, is kind of geared toward um, one focus or one vision or one <coughs> executing a mission. It's really putting into action what our agenda is all about. And that one thing is making sure that we're providing more pathways for an individual, for the individual Hoosier, for a business, for a community to take it to their um, next level. That's obviously all centered uh, on our budget. That reflects our state's priorities each and every two years when we come together, sometimes in those odd years as well, uh, allocating dollars toward what we think is, uh, when time is of the essence, what is important to address. And so we have a long-term vision, obviously, in the state of Indiana, but we're making tactical, strategic moves every year along the way. So that budget that we put together um, is going to reflect not just our priorities, but it's going to also center on kind of four key pillars, those being economic development, those being um, uh, educational and workforce development, um, uh, public health and wellness development, and of course community development, which the Lieutenant Governor just touched on a number of those items, all built on this foundation of good government, good government service, um, being responsive, uh, adapting, being nimble in the case of Indiana to the needs of the day, come what may. We've seen a lot of come what may over the course of the last few years. It's interesting when I came in and I see all over the school core, um, this could almost represent our administration's approach as well, being stability and order and respect and always striving for excellence. So it's just kind of hand in glove, that foundation that we're um, all centered on uh, is important to each and every one of the almost 20,000 state employees that are working for every single citizen and taxpayer in our state. So I'm going to jump right at it and get right to um, our budget uh, and the priorities of our Budget. This will be our 10th, as a state, our 10th straight, honestly uh, balanced budget. It will, again, as I've said, fund our key administration's um, priorities. When you stop and think about where we were in terms of revenue um, some years ago, whether it be 2005 or 2017, and where we are today, we've grown significantly year after year after year. The budget that we will put together won't only fund these priorities, but it will also leave a healthy reserve. Both in the next two years, we'll be leaving as a reserve as it is right now, north of 14%. So we still will have north of 300 plus million dollars, understanding that the legislature has their own priorities too, that we're working on with them. So not everything that I'll kind of touch on, this kind of thumbnail sketch of our agenda, um, is included in what we'll learn about tomorrow when we submit our actual budget at 10 a.m. And then obviously I'll provide some more details, maybe a few surprises at the State of the State address on next Tuesday at 7 p.m. if you're at home. Um, and so again, this is built on this, what we've become known for, certainty and predictability, um, uh, continuity, and that's what makes, that's kind of Indiana's advantage and Indiana's edge and people can predict this is a good place um, to invest. In addition, we've got a couple other items that we're going to be addressing as we have in the recent years, that being um, making sure that we continue to pay down our obligation to the pre-96 fund. We'll put another billion dollars toward 
closing that gap. It used to be Senator Kenley hit, um, you know, we were, this was 2060 when we had plans to kind of get in line with this. And now we brought that up about 30, 31 years to its 2029 after this latest uh, installment. So a significant amount of progress has been made. We're also not losing track of some of the projects we have underway currently, mega projects, major projects, like uh, the archives building, like the um, co-location of the new deaf and blind schools, like Westville prison, high ticket items that we want to make sure we continue to make progress on. So we're setting aside in fiscal year 2023, so soon, uh, $1.25 billion to make sure those projects all over the state um, remain uh, in motion. Once we get past laying out the complete budget, then we get to how do we keep this economic engine humming or growing? Obviously, the pie is growing. That's by design, uh, not luck. And the, the way that we're going to continue to kind of keep our foot on the gas is making sure we're doing even more than we are today and making things permanent, modernizing all the tools that the Indiana Economic Development Corporation needs to go out and win the type of business that we want to associate ourselves with. So we'll be um, seeking to uh, establish a $300 million a year um, deal closing fund. We'll be seeking to establish a $300 million a year tax credit fund or tax credit cap, uh, providing that flexibility for the IEDC to go out there and get the deals that we want. We'll be looking at a $150 million revolving um, fund for, for site acquisition. We've made some um, historic announcements recently. We want to do more of those, obviously. And then we'll formalize through language. Uh, this is a good problem to have, but if we go through that funding, we want to go back to the legislature and seek additional appropriations uh, to make sure we keep the momentum uh, going. We're competing against states uh, that are equally nimble. And it, it, it's coming down to a, kind of the same six or seven usual suspects that are elbowing one another uh, out there on the court to get the businesses that we want, these high wage, high demand jobs. And to have this tool in our toolbox will, I think, be, could be the X factor, quite frankly. And then we'll continue to, as, as we have been at the IDC, at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, continue to fund entrepreneurship and innovation and marketing to, again, their audience, the, the business leaders in the state of Indiana, around the country domestically and, and internationally. And when you look at the percentage of business deals that we're doing here at home and abroad, uh, it is significant. And we think there's a lot more room in the coming next two years in that window to nail down a lot of businesses, but we have to have the resources to do that. And then I don't want to loss uh, another wildly popular program being the, you know, the number one manufacturing state in the country per capita we want to double the funding for our manufacturing modernization grants that are out there right now to the tune of $40 million over the biennium. This is, this is one of those tools that helps those small and medium-sized businesses remain nimble and adapt to the changing times and keep their workforces and their payrolls uh, intact and modernize along the way. For our economy, see my the workforce cabinet, DWD, uh, for our economy to continue to grow, obviously their fuel is that workforce that I just um, mentioned for us to reach that full potential. We've got to make sure that Hoosiers are skilled up and, and ready for the jobs that, that we're bringing to uh, the state of Indiana, especially when it comes to those jobs that you've seen recently that we're attracting, those high-wage, high-demand jobs. And so we'll focus on a number of uh, workforce uh, development initiatives uh, along the way from regarding every single person, no matter how young you are to however old you are, uh, whatever your profile is, we're going to be focused on you um, from a very early age, from early childhood, K through 12, through um, post-secondary, higher education, and then into those adult learning programs that sometimes they're the X factor themselves in terms of getting someone off the sidelines and back into the workforce or if you're underemployed, how do you move up that, that ladder uh, in the workforce? And so just very quickly, um, I'll dive into the early childhood 
portion of the, of the four, we'll seek to uh, establish a $25 million um, innovation grant with federal funds on this front um, that will help us provide, again, funding and support for employers. Think about on-site child care programs, chamber of commerce-led programs. We know we need more of it closer to get folks back into the sidelines. And we want to make sure those are um, um, quality and, and the capacity is there, but also the quality uh, is there and close. We'll work to reduce responsibly um, the regulatory burdens that are preventing um, workforce from entering into that profession. There's some things that we can do, so we're going to take a real hard look at how do we attract more uh, into, that, into that profession could be younger, could be on-site training, you name it. There's a number of ideas that we have that we want to put into motion to attract more uh, professionals into that uh, occupation. We'll look to expand access to um, the child care and, and development fund and also the, and on the On My Way Pre-K program um, by raising the eligibility criteria to allow we identified another 5,000 um, Hoosier families that would be able to uh, qualify for that program. Currently, there are about 44,000 in the CCDF, and there uh, are another um, about 6,000 in the On My Way Pre-K. Uh, and so we think there could be another potentially, as I said, 5,000 more join that 50,000 just by having those um, options available to Hoosiers. Then we move uh, on up to K through 12. We will be uh, promoting what we've identified as the single biggest dollar amount increase in K through 12, 6% in the first year and 2% in the second year. That equates to a, um, right at 1.157 billion in an increase um, over the biennium. Uh, significant to say the least. We'll also be looking to something that I've wanted to get at for some time now, and now is the time, carpe diem, I guess you could say, and that is eliminating the textbook fees for Hoosier families. I think this is, um, to do this will be meeting the spirit of the law, quite frankly. Um, we're only one of seven states, think of those as competitors that don't um, currently mandate this. Um, and those are, those are our competitors, just make no mistake about it, Texas, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, these are folks who take pride in actually paying uh, for those textbooks in that curriculum, and we can join that. We have the financial wherewithal to do this, and I'll just quote the law. Um, Article 8, Section 1 says, there is a duty to provide by law for a general and uniform system of common schools wherein tuition shall be without charge and equally um, open to all. And I don't think it could be any clearer than that. And so the next question is, do we have the ability to do it? Obviously, in the budget that we'll submit uh, tomorrow, you'll see we do have the financial wherewithal to get that done. It's about $160 million a year. It's important to keep in this into context. We currently have, if, if you're eligible, about $39 million that we pay for already, um, and so we're wanting to expand that to all. Um, and if you think about, if you're eligible, someone else is paying that for you, so it's almost double taxation for some, uh, for some groups. So this would be paying for those, the textbook fees uh, and the curriculum uh, for all traditional public and charter schools, as well as students who qualify um, uh, for free and, and reduced lunch at nine public schools as well. We also are going to continue, this is just, Superintendent, again, thank you, um, to the perfect location, the perfect backdrop as we continue to kind of lean into some of our, um, shall I say, literacy deficiencies or the work that we have yet um, to do. We're at about 81, well, exactly 81.6%. Uh, right now at the third grade proficiency level, we want to increase that to 95% by 2027. And to do that, we've got to continue to not just probably double down, but triple down um, on this front, making sure those kids are um, reading at that level uh, in, the, in the third grade. So we'll continue to 
um, uh, focus on the science of reading, making sure that the Indiana classrooms like here in your corporation, but here at Liberty Park, uh, are taking uh, advantage of the partnerships that, because of the Lilly Endowment, quite frankly, a massive uh, investment on this front. And then we'll go uh, back to the legislature and ask for another 10 million to get a, another match uh, for the Lilly Endowment and keep pushing on this at the very earliest of ages. Um, and we'll look for some other creative ways to um, create a new incentive program to reward schools and teachers who are improving, who are moving that I read three needle. And then one that um, is occurring right now, kind of almost in a hodgepodge uh, manner around the state, certainly around the country, um, we'll seek to launch the Dolly Parton Imagination Library statewide, much more methodically to provide books to um, children at home. It has their name on it, they get mailed to their home. Um, just to encourage parents to be reading to kids. I mean, I often talk to teachers who say if a parent would just simply read to their newborn through, you know, age five for 20 minutes a day, what a difference it would make once they get to school. And so we want to do things that can uh, encourage um, that, type of, that type of action. And then uh, we'll have the DOE continue uh, to take a deep dive ensuring that high quality STEM uh, the STEM curriculum is, is available in schools, and so they'll uh, evaluate and they'll publish and approve um, the STEM quality curriculums that so many of our schools are offering and, and are so critical in different pockets of our state uh, to get folks on the right pathway to, to their, have their ticket to success in their hand when they leave high school, if they choose to go right into a career, if they choose to go on to higher education. And then I want to um, restore our JAG funding. Uh, this, is, this is going from about $6.8 million a year to $8 million. It took a hit during the pandemic years. But this is, this is for schools who want to. They're not, they're not mandated. But schools that want to offer JAG, the program, to, to get students uh, associated with and connected to potential careers once they get out of high school if they're not planning on going uh, into higher education. And then we get uh, into adult learning, kind of the, the fourth uh, layer of, of our workforce development um, programs. Um, and and post-secondary, even, even before that, um, when you think about um, the needs that are out there today, it's not just the need for more GEDs or more certificates or more credentials. We need more degrees, we need more masters, we need more PhDs, we need, it's, it's not either or, it's all the above. And so we'll be seeking um, uh, from the legislature to increase higher education, their budgets by 6% also in the first year, 2% also in the second year. This is a 184 million, 3 billion over the, over the biennium. And then we'll be looking to um, the commissioner uh, at CHE, at the Commission for Higher Education, for um, already has some ideas out there. We'll be looking to, to support them, but performance funding focused on keeping the students that are coming to our state uh, here in our state um, uh, through, a, through, a formula, uh, through the formula and using it to, to make sure that our campuses are truly these um, pockets of brain gain, not brain drain. We're, we're really good on attracting students from all over the world to come here. We want to make sure that they're discovering their next adventure right here in Indiana and not somewhere, uh, somewhere else. We'll seek to follow up on our recommendation to automatically enroll um, all eligible students in the 21st Century Scholarship um, Program. And then um, we'll also seek to do something different um, here in the state of Indiana. It's a, kind of a personal um, source of pride that we have Martin right in our backyard, Martin University in our backyard. Uh, this is Indiana's only predominantly black institution. Uh, we'll be seeking about a $10 million infusion into Martin to where they can help deliver on um, uh, building direct pipelines with, with uh, a population that is not just vulnerable but in 
highly in need of having that ticket to their success. And so when you talk about, we do a lot of P3s in the state of Indiana very successfully. This is a P3 um, that's a little bit out of the box and one that I think can change the trajectory of not just, again, a community, but our state. And we can be a real uh, leader on this front for so many first generation um, college and low income uh, minority students. And we can kind of show the way and I'm very pleased to, to be working with Kara and with Dr. Um, Huddleston on this front to kind of do something new and, uh, and show that it actually can be done. And then we get to, as I alluded to, um, the final phase. Uh, the, the adult learning side of this and to where the DWD really becomes kind of central um, to, to someone's maybe last chance or a different chance to do something. And we'll be looking to, to build on what's working on this front, addressing um, issues where there are wait times um, through various programs. The DWD often serves as this front door to both the employee or the potential employee and the employer. And so where we have a need, uh, like with Excel centers, with, with the partnership with Goodwill across the state, where there's more of a need, where we already have an Excel center, we want to do more. And so we'll be expanding them. And where there's not one, maybe in Evansville or a different city uh, that wants one, we'll be looking to help fund that. We'll be looking to increase funding uh, for the online graduation Alliance so adults can earn their diploma and their credentials um, online. It's been effective. We can do more on this front. We'll be looking to increase, in general, uh, the adult education programs. And that's because we know there are, um, there are lines, there are wait times for folks who are wanting to get into programs. We'll look to uh, increase funding for the, for the um, Workforce Ready Grant, maintain funding for the employer training grant, pilot a program to incentivize um, um, unemployment insurance recipients to obtain their high school degree uh, or diploma. We'll look to fund, again, some of those um, governor's workforce cabinet recommendations, uh, making sure we get those underway. And then as Lieutenant Governor Crouch mentioned, uh, our INVEST program will be looking to boost um, their funding as well. It's just like Uncle Sam, we want these veterans from all over the country. As a matter of fact, we need these veterans from all over the country to come to the state of Indiana because we do have um, opportunity um, for them to take part in. And then we'll move to one that's not been easy, um, but one that is central to it all. Health is wealth, and it has to be discussed in the same context, um, I mentioned the need for more um, you know, credentials and certificates and uh, degrees and diplomas. We also need to get healthier as a state. There's just um, no two ways about it. I won't go through all the rankings today. I'll save that for another day. Uh, we could. Um, you've seen those before, I imagine. Um, but suffice it to say that we're going to have to do something different if we want a different outcome. I'm not a believer uh, that these outcomes are inevitable or they need to be, but it will require everyone, including us, this administration, to do some things um, differently. We have the financial wherewithal to hit this head on. And we've had uh, the Public Health Commission, again, Senator, former Senator Luke Kenley with us, Dr. Judy Monroe, Dr. Box, of course, Paul Allison, Bob Courtney. We've had a mix of county and city do a year-long deep dive and really um, look at a public health system that's been in place for over a century and, and approach it like if we were to build it today, what would we do if we wanted a different outcome? And discovered, obviously, that yes, resources are needed. Yes, more partnership is needed. Yes, sharing of expertise and data is needed, all the above. And I'll cut to the chase. It's going to take dollars uh, to affect that positive change or impact or effect. We think it'll take at least uh, $120 million in the first year. 
and about 227 million in the second year as we build the structure, the new structure, um, uh, and put it into place and get it underway. It's important to note, as shown on the slide up here, that the first year, 100 million of that 120 goes to the locals, goes to on the street, goes to that side of the partnership. And 200 million in that second year, the 227, is going to the locals. So we're building it from the ground up where the action is occurring in the districts. Um, and we think that this is going to be a way in the planning, in the building of the structure, uh, in the participation. Locals haven't scanned the game, too. This is 80 20. This is working in a number of areas across our administration uh, that we can, in fact, start improving on our health outcomes. And then something I'm equally and um, passionate about, Dr. Box certainly, um, Dr. Rosiniak, everyone that's come together uh, in terms of building out our uh, My Healthy Baby program. We're, we're at 82 counties right now. We've got 10 to go. Can't get there soon enough, but it will happen uh, in, in 2023. And then as the Lieutenant Governor also um, mentioned, a couple areas here that you alluded to that we can't retreat on either fronts, one being mental health. Um, we'll look to continue to expand 988. Um, we know that folks need not just a place to call but a, or a place to go, but someone to actually be working with them, the right person actually to be working with them. We had about, since July, about 15,000 plus, so it's gone up since the last couple weeks, uh, into 988, so we know there's a need there. We're going to have to put some dollars behind beefing that up. We're going to look to expand our local crisis stabilization um, units. We'll be looking to continue transitioning to the, to the certified um, community behavioral health clinics in the counties um, that, so folks know there's a place close to get the actual kind of care that they need, and then we'll um, continue to look at ways and, and support more funding um, for our local partners to not just address, but to ultimately reduce veteran suicides. We know that veteran suicides are about twice the rate of the um, population as a whole in grants uh, that are given to organizations that are, again, in the community have proven to be sex successful, and we want to be a, a leader on that front here in Indiana. The other kind of side of the coin to mental health and depression is something that's closely tied to it is drug addiction. And again, we can't, I won't go through all the rankings, but again, we're a target rich environment for improvement to, to say the least. So in 2023, we'll look at launching uh, a new treatment finder program to help people get quicker care, uh, closer care uh, when folks are in their most frantic uh, position in life. We simply, we, we've just seen too much harm or worse than that ruin to individuals and families to not continuing to, to lean into this and, and continuing to build out that regional system, very localized, of recovery hubs so that are getting that care. And of course, like locals, um, the state will be looking to invest in the national um, opioid settlement dollars to create more um, community programs like we're seeing crop up, very successful programs in communities like Kokomo, um, uh, those substance use programs and evidence-based um, programs in our jails all across the state of Indiana. So again, leaning heavily into mental health and, and drug addiction uh, programs. And then the last um, pillar, if you will, of the, of the four is, is what Lieutenant Governor Crouch mentioned about quality of place and quality of life and how they're hand in glove, how they go um, together, how they attract uh, exactly the kind of investments that we want and build the kind of thriving communities that, that we want. This is by design. It's very um, uh, strategic as well. So we'll be seeking another $500 million to the READY program, READY 2.0, um, this was wildly successful, is wildly successful. That's about 500 million in Ready 1.0. That's leveraged 10 billion 
uh, over the course of a few years. Um, we think another few years of that uh, type of investment will be critical to the state of Indiana um, as, as we see the years unfold. We'll be looking to um, live up to the charge of being the most trail-friendly state in the country and looking to put another 50 million uh, into our trail program so we have at least another two rounds over the next two years to connect um, communities. We'll be looking to do another 25 million uh, into the land, into our land conservation efforts, um, partnering with folks like the Nature Conservancy and others. Um, we know this is one of those kind of, again, Indiana's great outdoors. Every thriving region and community has a thriving outdoor amenity menu. And this is one of those ways that we just see the ROI of public and private partnerships coming together to, to really elevate not just goals, but the work that actually gets done. Then, uh, as mentioned as well, a lot, um, uh, more uh, broadband internet connections. We're, we'll, we still have some remaining funding in what the legislature appropriated before, so we'll have another round this year and then we'll prepare, it's important that we have a very successful program in place because we're preparing for another, every state will get about 100 million, 100 million exact uh, dollars for broadband internet connections later this year and then more potentially after that uh, grants that we'll be a applying for. We'll be looking to, as airlines come back online and decide their routes um, to secure more regional, more domestic and international uh, direct nonstop flights, key to a state like Indiana that fancies ourselves as being the crossroads of America, but also to be the cross airways of America. We'll be looking to support uh, Gary, Indiana, but Gary Airport's cargo development projects. Uh, and then we'll be looking to double the state funding for food banks uh, to supplement the local needs there. We know they've been, um, they've increased over the last few years, and we want to make sure uh, that we're helping as a partner, a good partner, to meet to meet those those needs. And then um, I, I should say, finally, for any um, thriving, prosperous uh, community, uh, they need to be safe. And so we'll be um, committing major funding on a number of safety fronts. Number one, we'll be looking to increase the school safety fund from the current 19 million a year to 25 million a year. We know the need is there. Uh, we'll be looking to increase Indiana State um, starting pay from the current 53,690 to a minimum of 70,000 starting. We'll be looking to, so good to see the professional and volunteer firefighters sitting uh, by one another, but we'll be looking to uh, implement regional firefighter training um, uh, assistance, the getting to that developing the hub and spoke uh, approach and, and infrastructure that's in place right now, but enhancing that. We've got about 14 training sites around the state of Indiana. We think there's a need for another 16 and working closely with our firefighting um, friends and investing in um, mobile equipment uh, to, to uh, meet address some of those gaps as well, and then providing critical and crucial PPE for our volunteer um, firefighters as well. And then we'll be looking to also, it'll, it'll be reflected uh, in, in our um, budget, what we support, but the funding for our courts. Um, talk about order, law and order, it's, it has a start and has hopefully a, a finish uh, that, is, that is fair. And so we'll be looking to support the Chief Justice's request to make sure that they too are able to upgrade in terms of data and technology advancements that have occurred and affected the courts all across the state of Indiana and, ex and expand their um, key problem solving courts that are so um, successful across the state. Um, I, I will say, just to, just to recap, that's a lot. I don't know how long I went on and on and on, but um, there's a lot more that will be reflected um, in the budget tomorrow, but it all rests on that good government foundation that I mentioned at the very 
outset, making sure those, all the, not just the cabinet reflected here, but thousands of other people that wake up every single day, public servants, completely devoted uh, to providing efficient and effective government to every citizen in the state of Indiana. So we want to make sure they have the resources uh, and ability uh, to provide exactly that, that kind of service. So we've, we're addressing um, in an unprecedented way some big and bold um, strategic, use whatever word you want to use, but areas that are going to take our state truly to the, I believe, the next level in terms of public safety, in terms of public health, in terms of uh, public education, in terms of community development in terms of infrastructure connections and strengthening our local partnerships and the bonds because of the programs uh, and work that we're doing together, assisting so many folks who are maybe on the sidelines um, today uh, to get into the workforce and not just in but then up, um, grabbing the next rung up and, and we're there to help kind of reach them as they reach to us, uh, reach out to us. And then enabling, of course, through all this, more dollars into regions, into districts, onto the street where the need is, is actually being met. And that all, in turn, helps this economic pie. When you go from, back in 2017, a revenue of about $15 billion to what we project out of about $22 billion, um, this is because the pie is growing and it's working. And then this is the time of the year where we get together on Monday and we start to really in earnest discuss what these priorities are. I'll say this one last thing, it, and it, it won't be the most important thing that I say this year, um, but we do have something else on our agenda, and I'll just get it out of the way. We're gonna settle the question once and for all about what is the official state sandwich of Indiana. <laughs> there will be a bill, we do have offers, uh, and it will be the bread of tenderloin. So. I will, not let that, I will not let that get away from us. So with that, happy to, um, Aaron, if you want to tee up, I'm sure yes. we have some questions as I've droned on long enough for them to form, form up the question. When called upon, for those in the room, please step up to the mic. We will begin with Brandon Smith from Indiana Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon, Governor. Good um, afternoon. Uh, first, and then before my follow-up, um, there's a big increase here. In the overall budget, a lot of big ticket items when it comes to a price tag. How do you convince the folks on the third floor who are typically less than willing to spend this much money on anything? Um, how do you convince them to do all the things you want to do? Well, we've got four months, first of all. Um, two, it's not my first rodeo. I'm not new anymore. I'm looking, this is my last budget. Um, we've got an incredible team obviously that's not starting tomorrow or Monday. Um, we've been at this. I've met with leadership, I've met with members already, so this is not of surprise. Our agency heads have been working hard on all these items. We think that they're not just legitimate, we think that they're needed, which helps us um, not be cocky about it, but confident that we can be persuasive. And we'll let the facts speak for themselves. But one, one good thing is about how we come together every January is we have a, a lot of different perspectives um, that get shared. And we don't claim to be having a monopoly on every best idea out there. Uh, but these, we think, the ones that I've highlighted today, and there will be more reflected in the budget that we submit tomorrow, um, are all needs, not wants. And then my follow-up is, um, while this is a, the total spend in the budget that you're proposing is a huge increase over the last budget, if you look at the inflation that's gone on the last couple of years, it's actually less than that. So it's arguably, if you account for inflation, yeah. less than the last yeah. budget yeah. you spent. Yeah. So is state, government, is state government, are schools going to continue to struggle to catch up with inflation that every Hoosier and every American is struggling with? Well, I mean, I think Indiana has done one of the better jobs, quite frankly, in the country in addressing not just inflation, but a potential recession by um, our fiscal stewardship, making sure that we're living within our means. You know, I might have been you, but I was asked a couple weeks ago about Senator Holdman's idea um, uh, on some tax policy, doing away with 
personal income taxes, which is exactly what makes this state great, is that we, we're never content with where we are. And we're constantly trying to think, how do we become more attractive? And how do we do the work um, to figure out not what's just possible, but how do we meet the needs? And I, I just believe that over the course of the next four months, this is a bold agenda that hits on topics that, again, um, are needed. They're not just a wish list. These things are needed, and they're going to continue to. We can demonstrate, grow the pie for an individual and for, therefore, our state one by one. So I'm, I'm excited about it. The next question will be from our virtual audience. Please unmute when I call upon you. Brett Stover from the Journal Gazette. You might come back to me just a second. Okay, we will move on then. Um, Emily Longnecker, WTHR. Hi, Governor. Uh, Indianapolis Mayor Joe Hogsett just put out a list the other day of the things he'd like to see happen in this next legislative session. Um, one of those was more funding for uh, from the state for infrastructure for Indianapolis's roads. A lot of folks would argue to have a successful community and attract businesses in. You got to have good roads. Where do you stand on um, changing? that funding formula possibly to, a, to accommodate that, to give cities more money to yeah. help with roads? Well, I mean, first of all, we took a giant step forward in 2017 uh, to establish and worked with locals, um, again, hand in glove, actually, and, and they had a pronounced effect on where we ended up in 2017 to meet local needs, but happy to, happy to sit down with the mayor of Indianapolis or any other um, city or town uh, and how we address infrastructure needs. One thing I can say is we've come a long way um, in terms of maintaining and building uh, our state infrastructure and that rests on kind of that final mile into the factory floor bay, if you will, in every local community. And so of course we'll be, uh, this will, it's a budget session and it's, it will be nothing different whether it's the mayor of Indianapolis or New Haven. We'll try virtual again. Abdul, if you could unmute your microphone. Good afternoon, Governor. Happy New Year to you and your staff. Um, quick question. Um, obviously, you got a, a, an extensive agenda, a bold agenda. How do you stop it from being derailed, sidetracked by uh, those, those issues that tend to pop up during session, whether it's you know, cultural issues, social values, you know, CRT, abortion, how do, you, how do you keep your fellow Republicans focused on the big picture? Well, first of all, I mean, you, you ask that question every two years or every year. Um, I let our agenda speak for itself. Uh, we'll be focused on this agenda. Of course, I understand others have other passions. They, they ran on them, which is um, being transparent. And we're elected. And so, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not a blockhead about this, where I think that just no one um, has their own opinion about why they're there and why they are serving. And um, we'll continue to focus on our agenda, and we'll weigh in, when appropriate, on uh, issues. I haven't seen any of these bills that you're referring to, so um, well, I certainly won't get in, uh, involved on hypotheticals right now, but we'll cross those bridges when we when we need to. Any, any minute that I'm spending on a hypothetical that may or may not happen is a minute I'm not spending on what, what we just went over. Uh, and that's why I turn my cards face up with citizens and the legislature and 6.8 million Hoosiers who are willing to listen. Uh, and that's, what we'll, that's the practice that we'll continue with. The next question is from Peter Blanchard, IBJ. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, could you explain the uh, $300 million annual increase you want to put into the uh, tax credit cap for the IEDC? Yeah, um, all, oftentimes um, we're looking to secure not just one, but maybe many uh, different deals. And obviously our tax policy and capping those and having the flexibility to do those for a one or a two or a three um, deal package is important. And so having, having that flexibility to attribute those um, caps, 
and tax policy is just yet another tool that we use to compete with other states that are doing the same. That $300 million increase, um, what was the Eight original year. number you're increasing it from? Do you know? So yeah, Chris, do you remember the previous? Excuse me. I believe the uh, tax credits is we're just memorializing it and putting it in the statute. So just making it permanent. I see. And a uh, quick follow-up: uh, the $150 uh, revolving loan fund for uh, for site acquisition is that mainly intended for the Leap District in Boone County, or are there other areas of the state you're looking at? No, it's not mainly intended for any one. <laughs> um, it's mainly intended for more. And again, we'll be working with partners. This isn't the state going in and taking, there's nothing eminent domain about this. This is, this is others stepping forward that say, wait a second, we have an ideal location for such a venture. And we're looking for a partner with the state. And oftentimes the state can go in and play this role, working every step of the way with the local community. And so this, um, that fund, that revolving fund will be key in realizing um, the benefit of, of that approach. Thank you. Next is in our, our virtual audience, Alexandra Appleton from Chalkbeat, Indiana. Uh, for school funding, I was just wondering if there has been any discussion to boost funding for English language learners as IDOE requested a few weeks ago. You want to speak for yourself, but I'll tell you, uh, yeah, good. No. We chose to Alexandria, we, we, and I want you to have your say. Um, we chose to go down the tuition support. It provides obviously the most flexibility in, instead of looking at individual programs. But yes, Dr. Jenner, you want to comment on your Thank you for the question, Alex. So you probably know our EL student population, that trajectory continues to grow. In the state of Indiana, uh, we now have over 77,500 EL students. In order to meet that trajectory need, we have to, as a state, do an increase per the number in the equation of what's in the budget. But on top of that, we did ask for an additional increase, and that's because when we look at our assessment data, um, we've done these major evaluations, we see that our English learner students are those who are really struggling um, to, to catch up after COVID. There are student population that as a state, uh, we are most concerned about right now. And so we've asked for an individual student uh, monetary amount increase as well and hope to get it. Thank you. Our next question is from Meredith Hackler, RTV6. Good afternoon, Governor, and happy to be here. So obviously you've been very committed to increasing teachers' pay in this pamphlet you just sent out to the press. It says you want to increase that to $60,000 a year. Uh, in that commitment, is there a same commitment to making sure that health premiums stay the same so that roughly five, dollars $6,000 that teachers are going to be getting more a year doesn't go simply to their health care costs? When I, when I said 60000 I mean at least 60000 That's very dependent on the local bargaining units, but we believe with this north of a billion dollar increase allows us to build on that progress that we've made over the last two budgets and get us there. Obviously, when you look at the total compensation, an average is at least 75,000 for every teacher in the state of Indiana, the average. Um, meaning, if we're at 56, 690, then we've got room to go to get to that 60. But I believe that we have the means to do that and we'll certainly, um, look to be good partners when it comes to um, the funding where it gets directed to. But this will require, I mentioned to the superintendent before we walked out here, that I, I'd like to sit down sooner rather than later um, because those local bargaining units that go through that compensation package, they're the ones that ultimately determine that figure. And I'm all for that. I'm all for that local um, determination. I don't want the state to come in and start setting um, those those levels but but we do have within our ability to make it possible to get there 
and by the way, we'll be working with, this is something that's of great concern to myself and to the legislature, on health care costs in general. And so that train will be moving down the track over the next four months as well that won't just affect teachers, but the, the population at large as well. Have you been in conversations with the Indiana State Teachers Association or any other teachers unions about their take on these situations or their take on your policies? We've, we've, we've read their uh, agenda, their 2023-2024 uh, budget agenda, and we'll be in, uh, as we have been in the past, conversation with them as the four months unfold. Next to our virtual audience, Dave Banger from Based in Lafayette. Governor, on higher education, um, what metrics do you want to see from the universities and how are you going to measure whether their students are staying in Indiana? What's the rationale and what are you going to measure that against? Well, again, I mean, I'll just be general about this at the outset. And we want to make sure more of the students that are coming here that leave stay here. Um, and we'll be working with Chris Lowry at the, the commissioner of CHE has some good ideas that we'll be looking to support through the formula uh, that will reward more of those students via funding uh, who stay here and the schools. I think that's fair and accurate to say. So that's how we'll measure it. Our next question is from Caitlin Lang, State Affairs. Hello. Um, your budget contains some money for trauma care or EMS initiatives as part of the recommendations from the Public Health Commission. Why is trauma care an important area to invest in? And do you think more will need to be done in the future aside from what's in this budget, such as, uh, you know, funding for creating more trauma centers, things like that? Okay. You want to share about the gaps that we're seeing? That's a, a great question, and thank you for that. Um, Trauma is the number one cause of death for Hoosiers ages 1 through 44, and a lot of people don't realize that. And whether you live or die and you have long-term disabilities depends a lot on who picks you up originally, who can stabilize you, whether you're able to get to a trauma center to address your particular issues, whether even time-sensitive emergencies like cardiac problems or um, stroke problems can be addressed at the particular hospital that you're going to. And we saw definite gaps during the pandemic with the ability to be able to pick people up by EMS and get them to higher levels of care, have inter-facility transfer that needed to occur. So we clearly, during the pandemic, supplemented the EMS. We really need to support Department of Homeland Security and how we recruit and how we train, how we advance the level of education that our EMS has, and how we retain those individuals so that we go from basic life support to advanced life support and, and we have the um, ambulances that are equipped to, to manage all of that. It's also really important, important to look at the trauma centers around the state. We just had um, the American College of Surgeons here doing an evaluation for our trauma system. Our last one was in 2008. I can tell you Dr. Lindsay Weaver and our team did an amazing job with them when they were here. And what we saw was that we had grown from eight trauma centers in 2008 to 24 trauma centers now. But we have a map that shows you clearly there are a lot of areas of white space that are not within that 45 minute window that is recommended of a trauma center. So we need to improve that. We need to be collecting data and having um, quality improvement programs that are around the data that we find from that, making sure that we are able to fund the trauma centers to be able to not only grow but to educate those hospitals that aren't trauma centers about how we bundle that patient up and quickly get them to the trauma center that they need to be. And then we really clearly need to be able to work on things like our 911 interoperability so that every Hoosier that suffers a major injury or trauma actually is able to be cared for by the closest and most appropriate EMS system. So there's a lot of really important things in there, a lot to unbundle, but certainly with that being the number one cause of death for Hoosiers 1 to 44, it's very important to address it. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question is Kristen Escal, Fox 59. Hey, Governor. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, so I want to ask you about an item that I haven't seen on your agenda, but Republican legislative leaders have talked about, and that's property taxes. Mm -hmm. On Organization Day, Speaker Houston floated the possibility for property tax relief this session. I've spoken with several local officials who are concerned about potentially their biggest source of revenue taking a hit. So where do you stand on the potential for property tax cuts? Yeah. Well, I've, I've shared the same uh, conversation with leaders in the House and the Senate. We're 
taking a, we're watching this very closely as, as the tax bills will hit. We're looking at the reasons why, uh, whether it's through a referendum or, or why someone's property taxes are um, expected to go up. DLGF is taking a really a hard look and will be presenting to not just myself but to legislators as well in the early parts of this session as in, in the next couple of weeks uh, to better inform us so that we're not taking a step or taking action um, that is unwarranted. So yes, we're, we're watching this very closely. It's too soon to, to come out with uh, a property tax cut. We, we made, again, um, this is back in what, Luke, probably 2006, said we did property tax reform. Um, no, it would have been eight or nine. Uh, that, that really um, put us on solid ground in terms of capping property taxes. Uh, the assessed side of the equation, of course, you want your property value to increase until you don't want it to increase to where it prices you out. Um, and so we're, we'll, we're mindful of this and we're watching this and we'll work with the legislature to make sure we get it right, but not at the expense of um, what we were able to achieve not too relatively long ago. Are there other ways you think the legislature can help this session with housing affordability statewide? We're looking at a number of items in terms of housing, yeah. And, and when I, you know, the, the hard, part of, hard part about rolling out an agenda, being a thumbnail sketch of it all, is there are a lot of other items in this. But housing is certainly, like child care, something that affordable housing especially, uh, making sure that there are uh, means available. But this is, this is one of those issues where you want to make sure you get it right because it takes, again, partnership at the very local level too and a willingness to build new affordable housing, not just having the funding available or like a revolving loan fund like we do for water projects, et cetera. So there's a lot of ideas percolating or, or circulating out there. Um, and I, I think we'll make some progress on this front too. Our next one is Erica Heron, Indy Star. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, you have a lot of big increases in spending in this budget. Um, the economists are predicting a mild recession um, coming up here soon. Any concerns that we won't, won't be able to sustain some of the spending into the future? Well, we're looking at the same revenue forecasts that you are, and we're planning accordingly. And the good news about a mid-December forecast is there's one in April before we are scheduled to adjourn. When I mentioned being nimble, um, we've had to do this ever since I've been involved, um, just speaking from my own personal experience. And so we'll, we'll be mindful not to spend more than we have. Uh, this doesn't, as I mentioned, this budget that we'll submit tomorrow at 10 a.m. does not do that. In fact, it's leaving 14.4% um, in reserves, and that's by design. That's for a couple reasons. One is that we know there's some other areas that we could grow, uh, and we know that there are some issues out there that the legislature, with all due respect, are going to put forward in the next week or so as well. And there's some good ideas out there, and I wanted to leave room uh, to be supportive of those efforts as well as they come together. So we're not, we're not spending more. I mean, the budget that we have presented uh, is balanced. It doesn't spend more than we take in, forecast or actual. Our next question is from our online audience. Kathy Tretter, if you could please unmute your microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Kathy. How goes, um, how goes Santa Claus? The town. Santa Claus goes fine. Fernand goes fine. We're all pretty good in southern Indiana right now. Yes, there you go. Uh, I was going back. One of my questions was asked earlier, but um, I wanted to ask about, oh, let me find my note, um, about it's school funding. But how, so you want to expand eligibility for 21st century scholarship program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But how do we get to that pre-K, to that group, to helping cover so that 
parents can frankly go back to work if they need to. I mean, is federal funding going to be part of that $25 million? That's right. So I tell you what, Kathy, I'm looking at my, my colleagues, the chair of ELAC who's here, Maureen Weber, as well as Dr. Dan from FSSA who really leads this effort for our state. Um, you heard a, a couple of things. One is the governor announced um, about $25 million that will be invested specifically for on-site child care in, in businesses. And when I say child care, on-site early learning, supporting students, getting them ready for, uh, for kindergarten. Additionally, we just, I don't know if that press release uh, has gone out yet. I'm looking at the team. Uh, okay. We have a, uh, we, got, we got a federal grant that is coming out soon. <laughs> well, good. That's why I was really curious about how that was going to, to be developed and, and how we were going to pay for it. Way to reel it back in, Katie. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Our next question is from Garrett Bergquist, Wish TV. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Given the role that uh, education is playing in this budget, should lawmakers change the complexity formula to take into account factors such as area income, that sort of thing? It's not the, it's not the track I'm going down. And then also, you mentioned uh, STEM curriculum. What sort of overlap does what you're looking for in that area have with some of the things that Speaker Houston Company have talked about regarding high school curriculum? What sort of discussions have you had there? Considerable. <laughs> <laughs> there is. I can confirm. We're in line. We, we, we're of one mind in terms of making sure that there are quality programs in place, inventoried, um, and in place, and funded um, so that uh, students can, uh, again, not to be a skipping record, but have that their ticket to success, which often is tethered to this new economy, the digital economy. Uh, those, those STEM subjects are critically important to have in place across the state of Indiana. We just want to make sure they're quality and that they lead to something of significance. Our next question is from Casey Smith, Indiana Capital Chronicle. All right, we will go to Tom Davies, AP. Hello, Governor. Um, you've addressed this some, but just how realistic with the percent increase you're proposing for our schools to meet both the inflationary increases that they've seen uh, and also meet that 60K student uh, teaching goal? That seems uh, that's going to be a big lift for school districts is what you're proposing enough to do that. I'm just I'm looking on what they've been able to accomplish over the last two budgets and projecting forward Understanding, I mean, we, we deal with the inflationary factor as well in everything that we do. But 1.1 uh, plus billion is significant and will go a long way. A 6% six, 6 increase in year one and 2% in year two, um, I think, gets them down the road. I'd be happy to have further discussions um, with the superintendents and the principals, et cetera, every association that's concerned about this. Um, critically important uh, issue, uh, but we think that we're uh, offering at least the most on record dollar increase ever before in our state's history, and that's building on a foundation that has been growing over the recent years. Governor, that concludes the media portion. So what portion's next? <laughs> Bread and tenderloins for all? Yeah. Thank you all very much for being here. Appreciate it.